Hi, I'm Laura. Hi, I'm Deanne. And I'm Philippe. And welcome to our Lyman Book Club. We are starting The Disorderly Nights by Dorothy Dunnett. And in this uh, video, we're going to cover the entirety of part one. Um, before we get into it, um, we want to do a celebratory toast. Um, and we are, one, we're filming this video ahead of time. We're going to set it to air on International Dorothy Dunnett Day. Um, so we want to toast to Lady Dunnett and thank her for all her wonderful writing that has given us so much to talk about. Um, and right before we started filming this video, we found out that uh, Joe Biden is our president-elect and we are so happy. So we are toasting to President-elect Biden also. Yay! Yay! Cheers, everyone. Cheers, virtual toasts. And I'm going to enjoy this wine while we chat about. <laughs> and I'll sip on my whiskey. Your whiskey. Whiskey. <laughs> so we are back in Scotland. We even have a map. Um, Dee and Philippe, before we dive into the details of okay, part, I would say, <laughs> this map, what is going on here? It is way <laughs> too hard to read. I spent so long trying to find Mid Coulter and I could find the clue. But also, here's Paisley. Aww. Paisley. Paisley. So oh, sweet. Um, but yeah, this is a mess. Like, <laughs> we need to blow that part out a little bit or something. It was hard to read. Um, so what were your initial impressions of part one before we dive in? <laughs> I'm waiting for D to go first. Okay, okay. I'm thinking, I'm thinking. There's a lot of things that Dunnett says that I'm like, Oh, that's gonna happen. <laughs> like, there's a whole bunch of things that are just like, we should never let this thing happen. And it's like, well, obviously it's gonna happen. <laughs> and then um, also they're, they're blowing through time. <laughs> it's like a two year span in, or three year span in, in 30 pages or something. So that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to the book. I feel like we're gonna go to Malta, like, <laughs> That's kind of my impression. How come? Well, I mean, obviously, because we met a bunch of soldiers, or we've met soldiers from Malta, and this girl is going to, I don't know, run away and go back to Malta, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's up with her, but um, yeah. How about you, Philippe? Any first impression? Um, I'll say that this is the first of the Lyman series that I was into immediately. Um, I mean, I think I've made it known that the first book was very difficult for me. I, I wasn't really into it until at least like the first hundred or 150 pages. Um, and the second book, I enjoyed the intro better, but there were so many new things happening that I was like, oh, but like the first section of this book is like catching up with old friends. Mm -hmm. and, and I really enjoyed sort of the jump back to Scotland to see what we'd missed. And, um, I was assuming in the beginning, after the first couple pages, that we had gone back in time, but it was nice to know that I sort of read that correctly. So like that whole section uh, is mostly before all of the events of Queen's Play. So yeah. it was cool to see um, Will Scott and the cultures and check in with some other people. So that was a lot of fun. Um, I like I like it so far. I'm interested to see what happens. I literally have no idea where it could go yet because I think most of it was just exposition, but you know, that's necessary, so. I think um, this was, I think this is a fan favorite and one of the more popular ones in the series. A lot of people have it as their favorite. Um, and part of that is it's so, it's a very easy read. You jump right into the action. You're not trying to keep track of what, who's that, who's that, who's that. You're just like diving in and cool things are happening and it's funny um, and it's exciting. Uh, and, and it's just like, just way more readable. Yeah, this first action sequence was hilarious <laughs> and like just fun, like super fun. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, so let's jump in. So we start with part one, Mother's Baking. Um, we are in October 1548, which is actually, as Sleep said, we are back in time. Um, this is two months after Game of Kings ended. Um, Game oh, of Kings ended in August 1548. I suppose I could have just looked at the date and known immediately we were back in time, but you know, 
who pays attention to details in a Dunnett book? Um, and we start with the uh, really fantastic opening sentence here. Um, on the day that his granny was killed by the English, Sir William Scott, the younger of the flu, was at Melrose Abbey marrying his aunt. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot going on there. So much going on. It cracks me up how much Dunnett emphasized him marrying his aunt. Like, it was like this wink, wink, nudge, nudge. He's marrying his aunt, you know, but she's not related to him at all. No, <laughs> no. And she's like, she's his age because Watt right. is significantly older than Janet and she's Janet's sister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's also, it's very funny and it's very dark. Like his granny has been killed. Um, that's sad, that's, uh, but at the same time, yeah. the way it's written is, is like for the humor value in the like sort of absurdity of all these things. Yeah, like this um, dark turn on humor, which, which kind of goes throughout this whole section. It's interesting to note that Dunnett has abandoned the sort of little snippet at the beginning of each chapter to sort of give you an idea of what's coming. Okay. So I don't know if that's going to carry through for the entire book, but just, just something to note. Do you, do you miss it? Not really. I mean, there was a lot of time spent trying to figure out what those things meant, and a lot of them were super awful as well. But, you know. Yeah, yeah I don't miss it. I, it. I mean, it was it was like a puzzle figuring out, but I feel like her writing is enough of a puzzle. Like, we don't need, we don't need extra puzzle. <laughs> I'm with you. I don't miss them. Um, so, we're at this wedding, and it's a really funny wedding because we're still in the border wars. The English are still fighting the Scottish, and all the men in the wedding have their wedding finery with armor underneath, so they're making all these like armor clanking noises. Um, and then in the middle of the wedding, uh, the word comes from the Crawfords that uh, the English have attacked the Flu's land, and so all the men run off and leave the wedding to go fight the English. Um, any thoughts on this opening, just in terms of like how it sets the tone for the book or what it sets you up to expect for the rest of the book? Well, I do think you're right about um, it sets up this, it sets up both humor and action, which I think is a nice tone. Like I'm looking forward to seeing how that plays out throughout the novel. Um, although I feel like just knowing Lyman and Dunnett that tragedy is going to ensue at some point, <laughs> but um, of course. Yeah. But she's just got, I, I mean, she's just got such wonderful turns of phrase, like duly packed like broccoli onto the lawn, you know, <laughs> and, and, uh, um, and just the way that her, she describes uh, Grizzle, is that how you would say? I mean, Grizzle. Grizzle. Grizzle cracks me up. Like she's mm. so much like Janet and I kind of love her. And her and Will's interactions later on in the section are fantastic. So, yeah, and then it sets up this, um, the, like, this feud between the Kerrs, 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 uh, and the, and the Scots, um, which. What's going to come of that? Yeah. That does not seem to be boding well. No. Could lead to something later on, definitely. Yeah. Especially um, if Lyman isn't around to, like, prevent things from happening. <laughs> um, so we have the, uh, I'll just note, the jingling bridegroom, which is an amazing image. And we have um, Will asking his father, where are the Crawfords? And we're told, you know, he, what he means is, where's Lyman? He's still got his hero worship slash giant crush on Lyman going on. Yeah, there's one point. Where was the line that was super explicit about that? Oh, it's later. It's later when, it's I think later. later when he like. He talks about <laughs> focusing on his marriage, not Lyman. Oh, yeah, yeah, that. And then when Lyman shows up and Will's like eating soup and he like misses his mouth, stands up, sits down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, giant crush. Yeah. Um, before we move on from this section, um, they're getting married at Melrose Abbey, which is a place you can visit in Scotland. Here's Melrose Abbey. Ooh. Um, I was going to go there this year. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. 
It's not um, the same place that Agnes Harry's and uh, I, John Maxwell got married, is it? Or were they, they were in Edinburgh, I think. Maybe it was Melrose, I don't remember. Uh, no, because I think they were in Edinburgh. Weren't, weren't they at Holyrood? Oh yeah, they were at Holyrood, you're right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. I don't know why I asked that question, just. There's only one abbey in all of Scotland where people can get married. It's only one. <laughs> They're not a religious people at all. Also, I love the fact that being called to battle makes his wedding perfect, according to Will. <laughs> and that he says um, he was born on a vast, angry joy <laughs> as he rides off. And you're just like, oh. <laughs> this is a little bit like his father with his enthusiasm for uh, killing the curs, cares. Yeah. Um, so in our next section here, um, we meet Piero Strozzi. Um, Piero is um, one of the Europeans who's over here um, because of the alliance between Scotland and France, um, helping out the Scottish. Um, I have a picture of Piero here. Um, and I will also, I guess we should mention the character notes of him, which is like, he has a dour face, but he's actually a practical joker. But his brother's even more of a practical joker. Leon. His brother was worse, yep. Piero is one of our actual historical people, correct? Yeah, yeah that's a real picture of him. Um, and he is a marshal of France, which means, you know, like a military leader. Okay. Um, oh, and actually, I have his brother, um, who we talk about, the one who's even more of a practical joker. Yeah, uh, we haven't met him yet. Yeah, this is him, Leone Strozzi. He's the one who's a knight of St. John. Okay. Again, a real historical figure. Are they Italian under the service of France? Um, I think they're Italian, yeah. I mean, they're very Italian names, Piero. I, yeah, I saw one of their, like, oh, let's see. I saw one of their castles when I was in, not castles, one of their chateaus or whatever when I was in Florence, because they were rivals with the Medici. Oh. Like, I know anything about Italian history. It's <laughs> just like, oh, okay. I know the Medici. I do know the, I do know the Medici, the Medici, the Medici. Um, Catherine, who's the Queen of France, is a Medici from the previous book. Yeah. Um, so um, they have this conversation, uh, and they, like you were saying, we start getting these references to the Knights of St. John. So um, Leone Strozzi um, is, a, is a prior of the noble order of the Knights Hospitallers of St. John in Jerusalem, blah, blah. Um, and they're talking about, uh, Strozzi and uh, Will are talking about him meeting Lyman and whether he's a fit for Lyman. Um, and I think the idea um, from Will's side is that Lyman and Strozzi maybe aren't gonna get along because uh, Lyman is not so much for the religious side of things. Um, although we do learn that Leonie is a practical joker, so maybe it will fit. Maybe they will. I love that Will, we get a sense of Will's priorities here on eight when he says, um, but he liked her fine. She was good and broad where it would matter to future Buclus, which summed up all his mind so far on the subject. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, she'll have babies. Mm -hmm. That's fine. You know, they're a powerful family. They're marrying to create heirs and alliances. It's not a love match. They don't know each other, but we can see they start falling for each other and it's back to the city. So then we have Watt Scott also being happy because he gets to go fight the cares. Um, and we kind of get this background about these Scottish border families and their, their disputes. Um, and the part that kind of stands out is that Watt Scott's mother was a care, um, and his second wife was a care. So they're like fighting, even though they're all like interrelated and they're all Scottish and the English are their enemies. And it's, it's, you know, kind of the, the subtext is like, this is stupid. Stop fighting amongst yourselves when you have a, an actual enemy in England that you should unite against. Unite against. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it even kind of refers here um, that the, the feud was discreetly refueled from time to time by the English and that Watt subconsciously knows this and ignores it because he wants to keep feuding. Right. I mean, it also says like the, the Kerrs and the Douglases don't like they are, they're caught between the English and the Scots. So they don't like, they don't want to fight the English sort of understandably so. So then they just feud with people. <laughs> it's like, 
the they're not going to unite with the rest of Scotland to fight the English because they're scared of the English. Which history seems to say is a legitimate fear. So. Uh, I think we have a lot of setup here. We don't know quite how it's going to go, but we can imagine that it's going somewhere for sure. Um, and then we jump to finally uh, actually encountering Lyman along with his brother Richard, who are in the hills watching the English attack. And uh, Lyman has a plan on how to deal with this. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> Richard's comment on his brother's plan is so delightful. What's Richard's comment? He says he believed his brother's present imbecile plan would either kill all of them or brand them as liars for life. <laughs> so, like, if it works, no one's going to believe them. And if it doesn't work, they're all going to die. I think also um, it's a wonderful intro for, like, if you're a new reader who just picked up this book for who Lyman is. Mm -hmm. Completely over the top here. Yeah. And, like, Brilliant. in the first two parts, we get these back to back schemes of his that are both pulled off to. Absolute perfection. Yeah. And they're both so silly, but they work. They're very silly. They rely on deception and things not being what they seem, but it's like deception for a greater good. It, it reminded me of that quote Lyman says in Game of Kings when he's like being really honest. And he says, I serve honesty in a crooked way. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so Lyman and the mid culture men are still in their, they're in their wedding finery because they're on the way to the wedding. Um, and we get this, of course, amazing scene where uh, Lyman uh, puts 800 helmets on 800 sheep and then they show up through the fog and the misty rain and the English see them and think it's an army that's come from Edinburgh <laughs> and run away. There's in that list of things they had with them, like a page and a half before you find out what the plan is, it just says they have this, you know, they have two shepherds and some pikes and some blah and some twine and some powder and blah, 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 and 800 rusted helmets. And I underlined that and I was like, oh. what are they going to do with 800 rusted helmets? I'm like, oh, that's what they're going to do with them. Well, you found out. <laughs> so funny. Um, you can also buy... Um, you can buy stuff from the Dorothy Dunnett Society that's like mugs with sheeps with helmets on their head and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, I love it. That's so great. Um, so we also have this like flashback to the English attack where they allied with the Cares um, and attacked Buku's lands. Um, and this like super funny and super dark um, scene where Buku's mother um, is in the castle that's burning and she, uh, uh, one of the attackers like climbs up to rescue her and she throws a chamber pot at his head saying that she won't need it in the afterlife um, as the good Lord had no doubt thought of more convenient methods after the seventh day when he had a good rest. Um, one, she sounds like Watt. Two, she's hilarious. Three, this is also how she dies. It's pretty dark, this old lady burns to death. And it's the aunt of the guy attacking who's the mother of the guy they're attacking. Like, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, he said. Andrew Kerr, or Dandy Kerr, as they call him. So, like, great, another Dandy. Never trust a man named Dandy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought that, too. I was like, what? We're going here again? It must just be a popular nickname for Andrew at the time. Right, Andrew. So. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start calling my roommate Dandy. There you go. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, we have that amazing, uh, you know, we sort of, we realize what's going on when we get the line about the English army turning, followed by 20 men and 800 sheep and steel helmets. Um, and then uh, Will Scott's wedding party, who has been alerted by the Crawford's messenger, um, also shows up and attacks the English from the other side. So um, they manage to kind of, you know, get them a bit. Um, and then after this, um, this is where we go back to um, after the battle and the, uh, the Scots and the wedding party are kind of catching up with each other. So we have Watt Scott, who's kind of belligerently um, putting at risk the alliance between Scotland and France, because he kind of just wants to keep killing the cares and he's um, annoyed at these outsiders saying, you know, that's stupid. Um, and so we have Richard and Janet and Will all trying to like create distractions and shut Watt up and like 
and you know make it up to the um the French who are after all there to help them yeah it's like dance with your wife father <laughs> <laughs> and then she's like actually I'm gonna dance with the what with the Marshall, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. you need to make nice and what is alienating their allies. Mm -hmm. I was very happy to see Lady Janet back in the fold. Yeah. Her oh. and Will and Watt. I love them all so much. Yeah. And uh, now Giselle, I suppose. I'll get to know her a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, so we then cut to Richard and Piero Strozzi. Um, and they are talking about Lyman's future. Um, and this, you know, basically this idea that like, okay, so Richard has a role. He's, you know, the heir to Midfulter. Will has a role. He's the heir to Buclu, but Lyman doesn't. He's a second son. He's not the heir to anything. So he's like this super capable, competent person who's not allied with anybody yet. So everybody wants him. Just kind of the backstory and setup of where we go in Queen's play, where it starts out with she wanted Crawford of Lyman and this whole backstory of like everybody wants him, everybody's trying to get him to ally with them. Um, and this is an example because we're still back in time of like what that kind of stuff was. Um, and I love the, I love Richard's quote, the peculiar imagination of the Crawfords is the inheritance of my brother Francis. Yeah. I also find it super interesting that everybody's just chatting about Lyman's sex life like mm. it's nothing like like it's just like topic of conversation where the marshal is sort of like you know is he well deposed towards France or to the religion or he smiled a little H has he commitments quite incompatible with a life sworn to chastity so like <laughs> Oh, and then Richard, in the last few months, Richard Crawford of Coulter had become very used to such questions. For sheer decency's sake, he seldom answered them. So, like, obviously, everybody's talking about Lyman's behavior <laughs> in this area. Well, he already has this reputation as this, like, debauched outlaw. And even though he cleared his name legally, all those rumors are still going around. And this is even before all the debauchery of Queen's play. Yeah. Um, but like, if all these people are trying to like figure, you know, how can this person be useful to me? How can, how can I use him? Then it makes sense that they would try to figure out, okay, what is he loyal to? What does he want? Um, how, you know, how, if I were, were going to manipulate him, like how, what would be my end, you know? And, and what direction is he likely to go? Is he religious? Is he like, who knows, right? And it's clear from what Richard says later to Sibella that part of this discussion is about Francis being bi. Like, I mean, they wouldn't phrase it that way, but but the fact that he's attracted to men is obviously not a secret because Richard talks about it with his mother later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Since so Sibella's kind of in denial, I guess at the time it wasn't highly approved of. Right. But I mean, that's kind of bold for him to like say it to the mother of the person that we're talking about. Like, For even Richard's though, mother, mother. yeah, on Richard's sake, like, it's kind of like, whoa, that was, that was specific. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. But I think, yeah, even the subtext here. Um, and so we then get um, Marshall Strozzi saying there's three people he wants Lyman to meet. His brother, Leone, um, who's the knight, a knight of St. John, the Chevalier de Villaganian, also a knight of St. John, um, and a uh, as sea captain there, um, and a Grand Cross of Grace named Sir Graham Reed Mallet, known to a great many people as Gabriel. And that comes up like all through this section. One of the things I noted is that every time that guy is mentioned, they give his full name and then they say something like, also known as Gabriel, or, you know, somebody, somebody parentheses Gabriel. And I'm like, mm. is the fact that he has this particular nickname like super important? <laughs> because otherwise like let's just call him gabriel i i have a feeling he's going to be a very interesting character and i look oh forward yeah to him. um i mean if you're gonna give a well two characters actually the last name mallet symbolism speaking it's a blunt forceful instrument and i'm interested to see if that's really what they are or not so. i'm also a bit curious because his sister is so incredibly beautiful that's like just gorgeous, gorgeous. And like with rose gold hair and all of that. And I mean, the angel Gabriel is supposed to be super beautiful. And so I sort of wonder if 
this is a reference to the fact that this guy is like really, really handsome. But maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Um, there's obviously a lot of setup here that Lyman is going to meet the Knights of St. John and meet Gabriel. What do you think he's, how do you think he's going to interact with the Knights of St. John and potentially Gabriel? We haven't really seen that religion plays a huge part in Lyman's upbringing or character yet. So I think if he goes to spend some time with the Knights Hospitaller, he's going to be very sort of on his guard and, you know, a lot of theological discussions may may come about from it so I think a lot of it's going to depend on if they're genuinely religious or not like if this is a group of guys who are genuinely devout and have a strong faith and follow their like are doing what they're doing because they are dedicated to God and helping the poor and sick because they have this hospital on Malta you know and if like that's what's going on then I can see Lyman interacting with them having respect for them and interacting with them as people who are genuine. However, if there are a group of people who are sort of using this as a power grab and they're not genuinely people of faith and they are, you know, man manipulative and um, untrustworthy and dishonorable, then he's going to interact with them in a completely different way. You know, so I, I think it really depends on what he finds when he gets there. And I'm, I'm, uh, going to assume more of the latter with what you said because yeah. the title of the book is the disorderly knights yeah. and i think it's pretty obvious that those disorderly knights are going to be the knights hospitaller so. yeah that's my guess too <laughs> I think it's some sort of power base on malta that's there's going to be like a cesspool of iniquity or something <laughs> like who knows i was gonna say if nothing else we know they're disorderly <laughs> that's true um so then we also have like, like you're saying, we have quite a buildup about Gabriel and Strozzi said something quite interesting. Um, when Richard asked if Jolita is a beauty, he says, you are applying mundane standards. You cannot do that either to Graham Mallet or his sister. What does that mean? Almost that they're sort of above reproach. Like you're, you're calling them, you're asking if they're beautiful, but like the level of their beauty is so high that to use these words is below like the level that needs to be reached uh yeah and and, and also he's kind of implying that they're like superhuman sort of or like inhuman like there was some language that around Gilletta coming up later that was very objectifying in a not in a like way we talk about objectifying today but like as in she is not human some of the language around that. And so, yeah, I'm intrigued to see like if they're going to be portrayed as like otherworldly in some way or, um, yeah. Cause, and also it's sort of implying here that she's like super pious, like she's so pure and perfect. And then we got like, she's out of brother Francis's territory. Thank God for brother Francis's which, by the way, <laughs> that sort of monk-like phrase, like, Brother Francis, I'm like, mm, really? <laughs> Brother Francis's standards were mundane, all right, and high. So he likes super pretty women, but he wants them for, like, earthy purposes, not <laughs> like, yeah. godly purposes. You know, he spends a lot of time with prostitutes and gets on very well with them. Yeah. Um, okay. Can we... So, um spend a quick moment. Is it Joletta or Jolita? Because I have a feeling we'll be saying it a lot. Jolita. Okay. Jolita. Jolita. So every time that I read that name, I was thinking of Dolly Parton's Jolene. So like that oh. song is going to be stuck in my head for a while now. Jolita. All right. Um, so we end this uh, chapter one with Will and Grizel um, reconciling and going off to uh, sort of the same way that uh, Watt and Janet have this very, very loving relationship where they express themselves mainly by like passionately arguing with each other in a way that is like not malicious at all and is very entertaining and loving. Uh, same thing with Will and Grizel off on their way to what appears to be a very happy marriage. Yeah, I also love that she references the fact that she's his aunt at the end of the chapter. <laughs> it's like, I've been reconciled for 18 hours, Will Scott said his aunt. And she doesn't say his wife. It's like, 
<laughs> his aunt is like, you better take me to bed. I, I do love her done it. It just plays with the humor. I guess, I mean, it must have been a little, I, I don't, obviously don't know the backstory. It must have been a little controversial to marry your aunt, even through, um, you know, not actually being related, but through marriage. But like, obviously, for whatever reasons, they needed the alliance or whatever, like, people decided to overlook it and that it was okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so before I mean, we move on. your cousins all the time, so. Yeah. Um, so before we move on, since we spent a bunch of time in uh, the hills around Mid Coulter um, and the Scottish borders, I thought it'd be fun to look at this. This is from uh, the DorothyDunnett.co.uk site, and they just have a bunch of pictures um, around the different views of the countryside that this stuff would have been happening in. Um, nice. I have to go back to Scotland. I was only there once. Beautiful. Sheep not wearing helmets. <laughs> not wearing. Um, if you take the train from London to Edinburgh and look out the window, you see these like incredibly beautiful landscapes. Mm. Where are all the heavy coos? Mm. Mm. Anyway, obviously some of this stuff is older than Lyman's time, but you get the idea. In Coulter Village, is that an actual? It's an actual place. Okay. Yeah. She didn't just make up the culture family. There was there was some historical sort of. She made them up, but I guess she took the name from what had been a real family. Okay. It's definitely like Lyman and Richard and Sibylla are all made up. Um, so now we're moving on to chapter two. Um, I guess you say it Ho Isa. I don't know for sure. <laughs> and sure. We, we have jumped ahead seven months. Uh, we are still pre-Queen's Play. Um, Queen's Play starts in September 1550. This is May of 1549. So we're like a year and four months away from Queen's Play starting. Okay. Um, and um, we start out, uh, basically we're now with the Chevalier de Villiganian, who is one of the three people for Lyman to meet. Um, and we get kind of, we kind of start with like big picture background on the historical context, and then we zero in on uh, like de Villiganian and his interest in Lyman. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have a picture of him too, because he is also a real historical character um, who did some interesting stuff. He has like an island named after him in Brazil, actually. Um, Nicholas Durand. Yeah, and he's very tall. I was going to say he looks short in that picture. I know, he looks kind of tiny, but... <laughs> yeah, it's really cute. Uh, portrait, but, um, I don't Google any of these people, by the way, because uh, spoilers. Okay. I, I have no... I've just decided I just don't Google anything when it comes to these books. Better <laughs> like, to finish them, and then you can Google to your heart's content. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so also, I love how this one opens. Um, it's in the spring of next year when the Coulter family were beginning to find their younger son's presence a little wary. <laughs> I feel like Lyman is the kind of kid where like when he was two and three, like your parents, like their parents put them in gymnastics, you know, cause they're just, they just have so much energy and they're just flying off the walls. And so it's like, put that kid in gymnastics, you know, so that he doesn't drive us crazy. You know, I feel like Lyman's that kind of kid. I think he is, yes. And he's that kind of young man as well. Yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Lyman at two and three was on a ship, a galley ship rowing. Because how right. young because of how old he is and we don't know. Yeah, I know. Like, that's a joke. He definitely wasn't two and three, but we like still don't know how old he is. And there there is another age discussion coming up. We'll get there. I do I promise you that one day you'll know how old he is. I feel like Dorothy Dennett is just messing with us at this point. Like once I once I read the the thing with Sibylla's comment about how old he was, I was just like, "All right, now you're just <laughs> taking the piss," as people say. <laughs> like that's just no, she's definitely messing with us. But she she always does that. She loves to play with point of view. So like we first see Lyman through Will Scott, who's young and naive, and he sees Lyman is so competent and capable and older than him. So then we start to see the cracks as Will slowly starts to see the cracks and realize, oh, he's actually exhausted. Oh, he's actually very traumatized. Oh, he's way younger than Will thinks he is. You know. Yeah. Um, but I love that. I think she's playing this, and I think she does it on purpose to keep that oh. ending and keep us guessing. Totally doing it on purpose. 
gives us a nice mystery throughout all of the books. Because I'm assuming we're not going to know till the end, so. Oh, I hope we find out before the end. I don't know. Ugh. We'll see. All right. Um, you'll find out. Uh, so, um, we, so, so we start with like the bigger backstory and again, we're getting these um, sort of snippets of the precariousness of the Scottish French Alliance, which it's not too spoilery to say, we know it's not gonna last. So these are sort of some of the cracks we're starting to show in it here. Um, the French are kind of getting belligerent. The Scots are kind of annoyed that they're there. Mm -hmm. um, and we also get some um, idea on how Lyman is so insanely competent um, he's spent this time um, devoting himself to refining his professional skills to undo limits. Because um, so, he's bored. Because <laughs> he's bored, yes. Um, but it does sort of explain why he's good at everything. He, he is a high degree of energy and he's working really hard on uh, refining those skills. Um, so Davilianian arrives, he comes looking for Lyman. He goes to Mid Poulter, um, accompanied by. Oh, wait, by we, got, we, can't, we can't stop. Oh, you're summarizing. Keep summarizing, then we can go back. Okay, he goes to Midpolter, accompanied by Tom, um, and they are looking for Lyman, but they instead meet Sibylla, who explains that he's away at a whorehouse. What were you going to say? Okay, we can't skip over the bit about on 21, where Lyman's devoting himself to refining his professional skills, etc., oh. uh, to the affairs of his family, and to keeping out of Sir William Scott's way, judging rightly that the marriage so informally begun would best succeed oh. left to itself, since a Scott, having got his bride pregnant, was apt to file her as completed business for eight months at a time. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, what? Oh, Will. <laughs> Even at his own wedding, he's like looking around like, where's Francis? Where's Francis? I know. And I love that Francis is like, I should just probably stay away from Will because it's not going to be too distracting and he needs to focus on his wife. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Yep, I love it. I love them. Um, <laughs> so we're back with Sibylla. We already have more of her here than we got in the entirety of Queen's Play. Um, and there's this great sort of comedy of manners where she's trying to avoid explaining that her son is off at a whorehouse <laughs> and then, you know, admit it. Um, and I don't think she's actually scandalized by it at all, but, you know. She's just, she's just following social convention and trying yeah. not to say it. She doesn't care. But, um, I love that common sense was Tom Erskine's forte. <laughs> I, just, I just have this image of Tom Erskine, like, just as he goes through life, just having this like slightly detached observation of everyone around him, where he's just like, oh, these people are all nuts. You know, <laughs> just just walking through life like that. But I also, I love like there's kind of a contradiction in him that's really great, a great character building, which is that he's this very calm, like very placid, very chill, doesn't like excitement, doesn't like spicy food, you know, just wants to stay home with his wife. But he's also like the shrewdest negotiator that Scotland has. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like he's very smart and very observant and very practical and also does not want life to be interesting at all. Yeah. Like, you know, like he wants it to be boring and safe, but he's also willing to put himself out there to make things safer. And I think that's also why his relationship with Lyman is so entertaining because they have nothing in common and nothing to talk about, but they like and respect each other. Right, right, right. It's yeah. like they meet, they're going to catch up, they say like three words, like, oh, nothing to talk about. And then they can talk about Scotland and like, yeah, they'd be great allies. They have very, very opposite skill set. <laughs> yeah, and personalities and personal interests. Um, but, but enough in common in terms of capability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're both competent. Yeah. Um, so we also learned that the reason Lyman is off at this whorehouse is because um, uh, he has been basically helping. Um, what has been happening is the English soldiers will come out of the fort and they'll go to the whorehouse, they'll sneak out, and then the prostitutes will either help them to uh, desert if they want to desert, or help them to desert even if they don't want to desert, which I think the implication is, yeah, they're basically Lyman's helping these prostitutes murder the English soldiers. Oh, they're definitely killing them. Mm -hmm. they're, they're gonna desert or die. Yeah. yeah. Um, and again, it, it's all sort of told with humor, but it's also really dark. Uh, which is the whole tone of this book. Um, and it's another one of these like Lyman trickery things. He's always getting up to some kind of trickery for the greater good. Yeah. Before we get to the trickery though, I love this. It's just another scene of Dunnett playing with social convention, which I love it when she does that. 
where at 22, <laughs> where Tom says, what's Francis doing there? <laughs> like, they know she's at Oros and Tom and Monsieur de Villa Gagnon, Gagnon uh, his eyebrows shot up because he's just like, whoa, we're going to talk about this in polite company? <laughs> You know, and Sibylla is like, well, said Sibylla, taking her time. I'm very much afraid he's chastised. So she, she goes on to explain it. But I love that Tom is just like, well, what's he doing there? <laughs> and, yeah, and the guest is sort of like, um, are we going to talk about that with the ladies present? I'm like, yeah, I'm very much afraid he's chastising the English. So it's not like, oh, he's just off, you know, frolicking. It's right. greater good of Scotland. And I sort of love that Tom knew there was more to the story. Like, that asking Sibylla that question is not actually a dangerous question to ask because there was actual, there was something behind it. Yeah. Well, and it's also one of these great ambiguities of Lyman that Donnet plays with, which is like, we get all these rumors of how debauched he is and how he's up for anything and he'll do anything, you know, implication in like anything sexual. Um, but at the same time, there's usually some sort of underlying reason like when he goes to Molly's, he's getting information. When he's going to Hoisa, he's helping, you know, fight the English. So there's always this ambiguity around, like you could read it as he's not debauched and decadent at all. He's just, you know, putting on that impression as a way of like doing good. And you could, yeah. you, could you could really like, you could read it as him being super straight laced, at least, you know, here. Um, or you could read it as him being like completely over the top debauched, even in Queensway when there's like heavy implication that he's sleeping with lots of men, like it's not confirmed. Um, and we don't, he's not doing it for entertainment's sake. Like he does, even if he gets lost in the debauchery, which he seems to get lost in the yeah. debauchery yeah. For, for various reasons that we talked about many times. Um, he still had a purpose. Like it, it wasn't just, I'm going to go party in France, you know? <laughs> like yeah. He's always got a purpose. Yeah. Now I like the ambiguity. I think we get closer toward what's really going on toward the end of the series, but she plays both sides of it really well. So you can interpret things different ways. And so when other people judge him and, and you're in their point of view, you're not, you're not like, wow, that person's an idiot. You're like, oh, maybe that person's right. You know, it, it, it keeps him really mysteriously interesting by keeping you unsure like how far he'll go. Mm -hmm. um, so also I absolutely love in the next section um, Will and uh, Grizel are talking about Will going off to Hoesis and he, he, he the, the, the thing that just cracks me up so much is he's like I already told you I had to go there and, and Grizel <laughs> says yes you did. A matter of duty you said and her cooking's rare. <laughs> <laughs> So like, how dare he enjoy, you know, her cooking? Um, it's not just about duty, it's also about- I mean, he comes back with like, your cooking's really crappy, you know? You know, they have this like passionate argument that sounds really like intense, but actually like, they, they, she runs off squealing with laughter. So there is, this is actually really loving and fun. Right. Like, and I love the end of this where it says the odd ways of women were new to Will Scott, but some of them he was getting to like, fine. Yeah, it's a good thing Lyman is staying away so that Will and Grizel yeah. can bond because they are adorable. Yeah. Um, so Tom meets up with Will um, and Deville Yanyan and they go to this scene where the English are attacking um, Ho Is's house. Um, and we get like actually quite a, again, like this sort of funny but disturbing scene where um, first of all, we get this beautiful description of Hoese's house and how she even got like a painted carpet and like this is a woman on her own that's made a, a life for herself and the English come out and burn down the house. Yeah, it was so cozy and they just burned it down. I do not like this Ralph person. <laughs> it's for Ralph Fulmer, yep. Oh. He, he was in Game of Kings and I think you said then that you didn't like him. I think we get this idea of him as like kind of a bully type. Yeah, I don't like him. I don't remember him from the book, but he wasn't in it a lot. But he was, he was, I think he was like threatening to torture Lyman at one point when Lyman was tied up. Yeah. Um, anyway, I could be wrong. Um, but um, also, so it's Sir Ralph Bulmer who's come out of um, the English uh, fort with uh, a bunch of men about whose qualifications strange rumors were rife. So the men who aren't is into the ladies, apparently. Um, to go, you know, kill the ladies. Yeah. We've got the men that are not going to be upset about that. 
Um, they, they're probably the ones who haven't been visiting the local women. Exactly. Um, and let's see. Uh, we then have this amazingly hilarious scene where they're burning down the house and then a bunch of women are up on the hill and they're like shaking their fists. Um, and there's a very sweet armful indeed, like a young cornfield in sunlit green silk. Before I even turned the page, I just wrote Lyman. <laughs> <laughs> Lyman imposter syndrome strikes again. I was like, I was like, nope, that's him for sure. <laughs> yeah, I knew it pretty, I knew it too, so. I, I did too. I think it's like by this book, you're like, you're getting used to her tricks. It's like, nope, that's him for sure. Mm -hmm. I just love so much. First woman impersonation, uh, yeah, in his first woman disguise. So, and um, that he's the prettiest lady of them all. Yeah, and apparently he was super successful because he even fools Ralph like riding behind him on his horse. Like, that's pretty close oh, yeah. to pull oh, off yeah. the, the drag. Yeah. Also, yeah. Um, her pale face bathed in run mascara and tears. He's a good actor. Um, and so he, uh, he does this thing where he, like, he turns to run and then instead reaches out a supplicating arm, uh, which is, we realize afterward, this is the signal to shoot the English. And like a third of the English die with tears in their eyes still from watching him. Um, um, and then we, then as, we, as uh, we get closer, we realize that these ladies, most of these ladies, a uh, few of them were the actual women, but most of them are men in drag. Um, and they've been hiding their, their weapons under their skirts and they attack the English. Yeah. Um, I love that. To one side of the guns, a broad belt wench with a beard let off a crossbow. And you're like, oh, okay. But I love the way she writes it where you slowly realize. Yeah. Also, one of them must have been Will, but we don't get any description of what Will looks like in drag. Uh. Um, but yes, again, the, the girl of the hilltop beseeched him, her eyes anxious cisterns of blue. If you didn't know before, you know now. Yeah. Um, and he's looking at her right up close and doesn't realize that this is Lyman. Um, and so then we get, uh, sort of, again, again he's gotta be super young, like, to pull this off. <laughs> like, ah! And certainly very pretty. Um, we already know. We know he's pretty. <laughs> um, so then uh, he rides. What? He said pretty young. <laughs> so he rides off with Ralph and like undoes his clothes so that when he basically when he gets back to his like soldiers, his, his whole clothes are falling off. Um, and we find out later the reason why that uh, he didn't tell him was because it, basically the queen. Uh, Dowager said, you know, don't let any men die um, protecting prostitutes. And so they did this thing that humiliated the English instead of uh, um, like uh, causing retribution from them. I actually don't think that's what happened because no? she said that, I think she said that about the Scots because they killed a bunch of English. Like they killed a third of the English. So clearly she wasn't talking about, I think they, he didn't kill him because of the retribution that would have happened. Oh, yeah. It wasn't, no, worth, it wasn't worth killing him. Like, but humiliating him, that was worth it. Yeah. So it was, I got orders from the old queen not to meddle. If I lost a man through defending a horse, she said she'd see me in jail for a year. So I made sure that- That's English the Scots. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, and then Lyman explains, we preferred not to expose the, those reformed fools living around Roxborough to the kind of retribution one did would make if their captain was killed. Instead, we made a fool of him. Um, so then we get the reveal, uh, of course, of who Lyman was. Um, and then this wonderful, wonderful moment where Lyman arrives. Um, and this is a voice cut through the uproar below. And Will Scott missed his mouth and got to his feet dripping, then mm -hmm. sat down and wiped off his chin. Um, this is, uh, Will is just so excited that Lyman is back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, any other thoughts on this section? Yeah. Um, they did manage to lose one of the women, unfortunately. Yeah. So it's just yeah. set up for what's coming next. Well, and she was a care, so it, and, it, and this was organized by the Scots, so it's not helping their feud at all. Yeah. Yeah. But I do like this interesting little bit about how for some people, like an apt punishment is shame versus death. 
So this idea, I wonder, like, I mean, this could just be a one-off little thing that, that happens in the story, but I kind of wonder if, if that might come up later too, that, that for a fool, like shaming someone as punishment as opposed to killing them. Maybe it won't. Makes sense. Um, so I have also uh, fan art of Lyman and Jag because who could uh, not want to draw that? You have it. We knew that was coming. <laughs> um, Aww. Uh, it's from Bella Rolls and Tumblr. Um, and, uh, and there's another one here that's a sketch from She Doodles on Twitter. Yay. Oh, Lyman. Very pretty lady. Um, so then um, sort of after this whole hilarious sequence, we're at the end, um, everybody else is asleep, but Lyman stays up and he talks to the Villa Ganyan. Um, and they sort of have this conversation that again ties into where we were before Queen's Play and during Queen's Play about, you know, what's Lyman gonna do with his life? Uh, de Villiginian asks him, this play acting today, it entertains you. And he says, it serves its purpose. We are not all children of destiny. Um, and de Villiginian says, I have heard a man whose lover has been killed speak like that. So I think we're getting um, some hint of Lyman's sort of like we know there's this underlying unhappiness and kind of hopelessness about what he's going to do with his life mm -hmm. um and and some bitterness that he tries not to let out about how you know he doesn't have a destiny the way that richard does and will does and yet he cares so much about scotland and wants to make a difference what did you think about this line because i'm not sure if i read it i'm not sure how to read. so the the knight says i've heard a man whose lover has been killed speak like that he said lyman's voice repeated dryly a man and in the buried red light, the Chevalier's face creased as if he smiled. Perhaps not, he said, but my premise remains. What do you think Lyman meant by that? I, I, don't, sure. I don't know. I mean, obviously, he questions a man. And then, so I guess is the implication that it would be a woman who would be more right. upset than a man about losing their lover? Yeah. So, like, a man's not going to be sad if their lover is killed? Like, is that what he's saying? Which is weird because men totally get upset when they lose their lovers. That's like the entire women in refrigerators trope. Um, so yeah, I don't know. And like, Christine wasn't even Lyman's lover and he was super sad when she was killed. You know, so it's like. Exactly. Is he just, is he making like a sarcastic commentary on what people are because i mean obviously there's a social convention that like men are supposed to be stoic and not upset and when bad things happen they're not supposed to react so maybe he's making like a sarcastic men don't feel that while actually knowing that they do kind of comment yeah i mean he definitely knows that they do yeah um yeah i don't know hmm. um but i don't know i just i just didn't know how to read that um it's interesting to know <laughs> i I read this scene probably completely different than you. Um, this is a seduction. I feel like Villa Gagnon is trying to seduce Lyman, not only physically, but he's seducing him with power. He's seducing him with the capability of having an army, of having men underneath him to, to lead. Like I read this whole thing from back to front as just Villa Gagnon trying to seduce him with this, mm -hmm. these several different ways. Oh, I think you're right. I totally think you're right. Yeah, because there's that whole everybody wants Lyman, which is, has this like political text, but this like sexual subtext. They're trying to seduce him into being loyal to them and working for them and serving them. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's definitely a seduction theme. Um, so, uh, so yeah, um, we also, we kind of get a reminder, um, I guess for new readers about how he doesn't want to sell his loyalty to Marie de Guise because she's more loyal to her family than to Scotland. Um, and we also get him basically implying that the religious life is not for him. Um, he likes his comforts, is what he says. Um, Vows of poverty are not for him. Mm. Yeah, which, I mean, you know, he's not wrong here. He knows himself. <laughs> so then also um, we, we have this sort of, com uh, sort of conversation about where different loyalties lie and they talk about the Scots and the French um, and then they start talking about the French being allied with the Turks 
-hmm. and how does de Villaganian reconcile that being a knight of St. John who's supposed to be fighting the Turks, but also French allied now with the Turks. I, I like this little hint about how plugged in Lyman is to everything where he says, we have accepted them, have we not? And then de Ville, Villagnon is like caught unawares was momentarily silent. So like he was surprised that Lyman knew about this supposedly secret thing that so yeah. it's just it was a nice little nod to how very knowledgeable Lyman is about what's going on in the world. Oh yeah. Which I mean it makes sense, right? He's got all these correspondents, he writes all these letters, he's met all these people in Europe, he's friends with every prostitute in Europe, apparently. They're all sending him messages telling him what's what. Um, he is very, very well informed. So I, I was a little confused here. France and Turkey have a secret alliance? Yes, they do. Because France's okay. enemy is Charles, who's the Holy Roman Emperor. Right. And so they're allying with the Turks against him because they have a con this, the French and the Turks have the common enemy of Charles. But yet, if that's true, which it is, the Knights Hospitaller are fighting the Turks off of the coast of Malta? Yes. I don't, it's, it's confusing to me. That's all, I don't know. Well, so the Knights are a mix of different um, countries. There are Christians from all over Europe, so they're not only French, there's a lot of Spanish. Oh, okay, Spanish, I thought this was Italian a typically French um, institution. Mm -hmm. All right, that makes more sense to me then. Yeah, but you can see already that the French Knights are in an odd position. Yeah. And Dibligandian is a French Knight. Yeah. Mm. Um, we also have a, a line that I just love where um, they're talking about, um, you know, how would a, a Knight of St. John reconcile being allied with the Turks? And the line is, it was impossible to tell what he thought. So Lyman is having a philosophical conversation about these kind of moral dilemmas, but he's not showing his hand in terms of what he really thinks. Yeah. And you have to wonder when the Chevalier says, when he's talking about that international aspect of the knights, when he says like, the knights of Malta are international, whatever their allegiance by birth, their first duty is to Malta and the bishops of Rome. Uh, we have all taken the same vows, soldiers and priests of chastity, poverty and obedience, and have dedicated ourselves to the victory of the Christian world over the infidel. So, but you also get the sense that this guy's pretty connected to France, so. <laughs> How, I'm curious how much of this loyalty to Malta is lip service on the part of all of these knights and how much is genuine. That is a good question. You will probably find out. Yeah. Um, also, because we do get hints that his vows of poverty, for instance, are not very well yeah. <laughs> held, or not held very close, basically. So. Yeah. Um, the... Felipe, I think you're totally on target with you referring to this as a seduction scene. It actually says it. It says the word seduction in here. Um, Lyman, Lyman flat out says, is Europe desperate for secondhand captains direct from the fripperers that every courier seems bent on seducing me with a new matched set of ethics? Well, there you go. I missed that part. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then the Chevalier blandly says, you're not a fledgling. Where does your manhood suggest? Like, and removes his shirt at the end of it. So. Yeah. Um, well, also very interestingly, Lyman says, my man had suggests that I should like to meet Sir Graham Reed Mallet's sister, Jovita, but not necessarily with 1,500 mercenary soldiers at my back. Um, so if there's this idea of um, Lyman being seduced over to the knight and that Jovita could be the way um, and actually, the, the last thing that uh, de Villaganian says here is, what you require in this life is a meeting with Gabriel and his sister. So that's a lot of setup. Any further thoughts on what that is uh, going to be like when it happens? It's a lot of setup. It's going to happen. We, that's about as much as we know yet. Um, that was going to happen. They're definitely going to meet. Yeah. And I feel like Dunnett is like, broadcasting it so much, like, oh, this is going to be a terrible thing when it happens, all these characters, that it's going to totally be turned on its head when it finally does. Like, she's, she's giving us this expectation of what's going to happen, but, like, it's not at all what will happen when Lyman and Jolita do meet. That's just, yeah. And, like, I don't have a sense of whether 
Lyman and Gabriel are going to be mortal enemies in a relationship that's going to like be tension fraught throughout these next four books. Or if they're going to be best friends and it's going to be like a buddy cop show for like, the, like I don't know. <laughs> like, I feel at this point with the foreshadowing that we have, it could go either way. So, yeah, that's true. Um, so we end the scene with uh, the Kerr's cares attacking, um, but luckily Lyman has arranged for them to be warned and they manage to escape. Um, and there is a, you know, kind of a wonderful final line here about Lyman. Um, he regards boredom as the one and mighty enemy of his soul. Yeah, I feel like that's like the Lyman character observation. <laughs> yep we've seen so far. All right. Any final comments on that chapter? It was fun. Like it was just fun action. So now we jump forward in time uh, almost two years um, and we are now near the end of Queen's Play. Um, Queen's Play ends of, in June of 1551 and we are in May of 1551. Um, so this is like timeline wise, this is right after Lyman returned to France and met up with Richard and gave him that gift. And then Richard left to go back to Scotland. This is Richard arranging his way back to Scotland. Oh, okay. Yeah. To go see his newborn son, Kevin. Yeah. You missed. She was at least two now. Not quite a newborn anymore. Two? Why is he two? Well, Why? because in the last chapter, the which was in, sorry. But he wasn't born in the last chapter. The last it year, it'd be like a year and a half. Didn't it say that their son was starting to wear on them already? No, that's Lyman wearing on them. Lyman is wearing on them. Oh, I thought it was Kevin. No. Ooh. Oh, we're so sick of this two-year-old. <laughs> no, it's Lyman. Uh, uh, Kevin's I thought younger son, I thought it was Kevin, was finding his presence a little wearing. Oops. <laughs> Oh no, so Kevin's still just bored and that's why Richard really wants to get back to him. Um, so we get our, our, our wonderful little one-line summary of Queen's play, which is that <laughs> Francis and Alfred of Lyman have been living in France repelling boredom with considerable success. <laughs> he did indeed. Mm -hmm. um, so we also basically, um, Richard wants to get home to Scotland to his wife and baby um, and he's hanging out in Dieppe uh, trying to find a ship. He finds a ship that's going back to Scotland, and it turns out he needs permission from Deville again in order to get on the ship. So they have a reunion. He goes to see him, um, and Deville again is actually escorting Jolita Reed Mallet back to Scotland. Um, and so we have this scene where Richard comes in, and he's like, "Why is Deville again in here with two nuns and an older lady?" Um, and it turns out this is uh, Jolita's, basically, escorts. Um, and, uh, and Madame Donati is kind of like her governess. And Madame Donati approves, so then Jolita is brought in and we meet Jolita. Thoughts on Jolita, first impression? She's like this paragon of beauty. Like this bright shining star that like everybody is just taken aback by her on when they first see her. So she's got this, um, they make a lot of her, uh, what was the fruit that they said? Apricot. Here. Apricot hair, yeah. So it's a lot of time spent on her hair, so. Yeah, her hair is like mm -hmm. miraculously beautiful. Richard's um, mouth drops open and stays open. <laughs> yeah. Like, she's apparently so beautiful that she's literally stunning. Like, people are stunned when they see her. But the one saving grace, so if that's all it was, I would find this character incredibly boring. Like, if she's just super pretty, like, that is not interesting. <laughs> but there was a little bit where it says, um, Richard kissed her hand and a vivid pleasure at once appeared in her face, followed by, he could have sworn, a flash of pure mischief. And so you get the hint that this girl is, is ha, there's more going on under the surface than just this super pretty kid, so. Yeah. And we get more of that later too, as she's like making up lots of songs and stories yeah. that are very Lyman-like. 
yeah. like ribald lyrics and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit edgy, which is like, hmm, convent bread, where is she from? Yeah. Mm. Where is she this from? Um, the the fact that when we first meet her, the first thing we hear about is the apricot hair is important. Um, and just keep in mind the motif of the apricot and Jorita. Um, and then we also have these weird images of her. She's 16 at this point, which I think is technically an adult in this. Yeah. Cult. Um, but we get this, these descriptions of her that are very childlike. Um, you know, her, her white teeth exposed unconsciously like a child's. Um, but then a little bit later, her voice was clear, firm jawed like an adult. So we have these like mixed images of her as part child, part adult. Right. But at 16, I mean, she can get married like easily. Like when did, um, how old was Agnes when she got married? 13 or 14. Yeah. Like 16 is not a kid. So it's weird. But I think part of it is like the whole idea of she was isolated in a convent. She's very, very innocent and naive and sweet and childlike. Yeah. Um, I'm suspicious of that. Why are you suspicious of that? I just am. It seems like, it seems like in our face, like she's so pure. She's so innocent. And it just seems like very in our face. And like everyone is having this dialogue around her about how innocent and pure she is. I don't know. I'm suspicious. It's a little, yeah. Um, so we, we end this little section with Richard's point of view where he says, uh, he tells her she must meet Francis and then he immediately starts to doubt it. Um, and he thinks Francis with his temper, his mistresses, his plunges into drunken adventuring was alien to this kind of fun loving innocence. For humanity's sake indeed, it was worth making quite an effort to keep these two apart. I love that it's like for humanity's sake, like I can see saying for like for her sake, like, it's better for her if she doesn't meet Francis, but for the sake of the world, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be like, that's a very strong statement. So. so I think part of why I love this book is it's so um, dark, it's so funny, and it's so over the top. For the sake of humanity, they must not meet. Right. Which obviously they're going to meet. Like, that's what I wrote off to the side. I'm like, well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> like, I mean, obviously they're going to meet probably pretty soon exactly um okay so again we get um like you were saying there's more to her than her beauty um richard notes that she is quick and articulate um they're on this voyage now going back to scotland um and she's kind of like a sort of an innocent lyman um playful and making riddles right lyman makes riddles puns tales of fantasy um and then we hear also more about Gabriel um, of Sir Graham Reed Mallet. Madame Donati spoke sparingly and with embarrassing reverence. Um, this guy must be something, huh? Yeah. I also like that they talk about these, these knights of the order as their medical knights, pirate knights, priestly knights. So like we get this, we get this three sort of sense. And the fact that there's a, that pirate is, the, it's not like, seafaring you know it's not like um naval knights or something like that it's like pirates so you get a sense that like what are they doing out on malta well and we have like this really interesting description of them which we kind of get twice which is like they have two missions they're there to take care of like the sick and especially the pilgrims who are going to the holy land um so they're medical knights they're there to care for sick people Mm -hmm. Also, they're religious crusaders. They came out of the crusades and they are there to kill the Turks. So on one hand, it's healing. And on the other hand, it's murder our religious enemies. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and again, what is Lyman going to think about? And we get, we also, we get the scent, we get a little bit of a hint of this guy. How do you say it? Dragout? Dragout? Dragout. Dragout who is uh, apparently a Turk. And uh, so it's like, he's so invincible. And then Jalita breaks in like, Dragut is only a man, a uh, you know, a Muslim Corsair in the pay of the Turk. How could the Knights with their faith behind them fail to conquer? So I get the feeling this guy's gonna show up again. Like, fun fact, if you look at Istanbul, there's a giant statue of Dragut. Oh, wait, where? Istanbul. Oh. Yeah. I went with the Dunnett group and it was like, we're sailing on the, the river and it's like, there's the statue of Dragoon. Oh, yeah. Cool. So yeah, I feel like he's gonna definitely show up. 
uh, I think it's also interesting. So we get this backstory of the Knights where basically they go back to the Crusades. Of course, as we know, the Crusaders didn't keep Jerusalem, so they got kicked further and further away, and they ended up being given Malta. Um, Malta is in a very strategic location. It's in the, in the middle of the ocean between Europe um, and Africa below it and like the Middle East over you know, the other side. Um, so it's a super strategic like landing point if you wanted to say attack Europe um, or attack Africa for that matter. Um, and so they've basically been given it to hold um, for strategic reasons um, for Europe. Uh, and that's why they are there. Um, and we, like you're saying with this word of Dragut, um, we're starting to get this hint that um, the Turks may be coming to attack Malta um, and that's why Gabriel has sent his sister Jolita away to safety in Scotland. Um, and we also get the info, the backstory that Gabriel is, has lost his lands in the English wars. So he's Scottish, but he doesn't have lands or money anymore. Mm. Yep. Um, so I then- We need to find a place for Jolita to stay. Yes. We need to find a place for her to stay. Because apparently the guy, the head of the order in Scotland, super sketchy. Yeah, yeah. And Richard's like, oh, that's not good. That's not going to be safe. I love the way that they can just sort of like make arbitrary decisions on behalf of other people. Because <laughs> it's like, like normally today we wouldn't think that. Like if a brother had sent someone who's his ward mm -hmm. to someone, like to a you know, to a guardian, like, you wouldn't be able to circumvent that. Like, that's not like, oh, this person's a bad guy. We shouldn't let this girl go stay with him. Like, well, you can't do that today. But, like, back then, apparently, Richard's just like, nope, we're not going to send her there. It sort of makes sense, because, like, you know, they can't make a phone call. It takes a lot right, right, right. to make decisions like that. So it would make sense also in a more communal society that the adults would like, protect the children and do what they thought was best, even if, you know. Yeah, and if Gabriel finds out, it'll be like, oh, well, he made the best decision in, in the moment, so it's fine. Yeah, there's no hint that they're doing anything like. No, 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 no. No, I didn't think so that at all. It's just so funny when we look at it from a modern eye. <laughs> like, how can you just arbitrarily make decisions about other people's kids? I'm <laughs> like, oh yeah, I guess you can. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, on this voyage, they're, get, they're heading back to Scotland, but suddenly Jolita falls ill. Like really uh, quickly. Really quickly, yes. Right. And, uh, and they have to go to the nearest place, which just so happens to be Flaw Valley. <laughs> <laughs> but Gideon died. Oh. It's so sad. Oh. He died off screen out of nowhere. I know. I know. And like at the almost at the end of Game of Kings, right? Because it says he's been dead for like two years. Yeah. So he died right after Game of Kings. It's really sad. Well, I think I I mean I'm not happy about it, but like I think it's kind of a symbol that things are gonna go bad. Because like we've got this character that we loved so much who was written off off screen and like it means the Dunnet plays fast and yeah and, and furious yeah. with her special characters because they're not real the Somervilles right they're also fictional yeah they're right? fictional mm -hmm. so, like she's willing to sacrifice one of them with no hesitation yeah uh, uh, it's an omen to me that Gideon is dead. I think I've dropped some hints that, you know, Donut is, is a little bit more on the George R. R. Martin side in terms of like, Oh, don't say nothing that. Nothing is sacred. Nothing is I sacred. don't want to have to throw my book across the room like I did when I read The Red Wedding. Yeah. Spoilers. Spoilers. <laughs> if you're not, if you don't know what happened People to The Red know. Wedding now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, so we got story. Kate's pretty awesome. Kate's awesome. So, so we get, um, I'll just skim through the, I'm just going to bullet point this and we can talk about it. Um, so Gideon's dead. Philippa is 13. She still hates Lyman. Um, Kate runs Flaw Valleys now. Kate is still only 30. Um, and we get the idea that Kate has developed something of a thing for Lyman, um, which is probably part of why Donnett kills Gideon off screen so that Kate can have a crush on Lyman. Um, and in mm -hmm. particular, we get these hints. One, in the fact that um, she sees the Crawford um, like banners riding up. And then there's this wonderful line, it was Richard. She smiled widely nonetheless. Nonetheless, yeah. Um, and then, of course, the scene later uh, where she's thinking of uh, of Una's beauty and kind of like fixating on how Lyman is with Una and it's a little bit of jealousy going on there. Yeah. Well, also, I think there's a point where Philippa's anger about Lyman is 
the implication is that she is she doesn't want Lyman to replace her dad. That yeah. like she's angry that that's a possibility. So. Definitely. It's also interesting. Jolita picks up on it very quickly. Yeah and mentions it to Philippa while they're sort of combing each other's hair. So she's very perspective, uh, perceptive. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, let's, we can jump ahead and talk about that a bit. It's like at the end of this little section, um, Jolita says, middle-aged ladies often imagine they have fallen in love. It doesn't mean anything. Your mother is very sensible, you know? So she is observant. Yeah. Um, it also really hurts Philippa's feeling. She runs off crying. Well, and she's, I mean, she's super, like her emotions about Lyman are strong and very close to the surface because she's talking about how angry she is at him and how much she hates him. And that's when she breaks into tears, like even before, yeah. even before Jolita makes that comment. So like, she's, she's got this ball of like rage. Yeah, I was going to say, what does that like moment tell us about Jolita and what does it tell us about Philippa? I think it's the first time Philippa has had these feelings that she was worried about Lyman replacing her father. And when Jolita says that to her, it's the first time she's really had any actual sort of proof. Maybe not proof, but like somebody agreeing with her. Like she's probably never spoken it to anybody and just having that said to her, that's why she goes sort of she gets really sad and runs off. I don't think there was any malicious intent from Jolita. I think she was just saying what, you know, was on her mind, so. Do you think that though? Because I think it would be interesting if there was. It's like, a possibility. If, if Jolita, it would be interesting if this whole super pious, super pure thing is just a total act on her part and like she said it on purpose because she knew it would hurt Philippa like maybe not like maybe she's just observant and was sort of like oblivious to the consequences of the comment but well I here's something if she wasn't there is something to think about um Laura said earlier it's important that she mentioned that it was apricot hair and if you think about apricots apricot pits create cyanide so that's the first thing that jumped into my head. So I don't know, maybe. But I, I think way too early to notice. Like that. poison in the middle somewhere. Like that's an interesting. I didn't. Thought. I didn't mean it in a spoilery way, but no. But I mean, but the fact that the fact that Dunnett is comparing her to apricots is already part of the story. So if that's the allude, like if that's the metaphor that we're getting, then that is true. Like I think. So we'll keep in mind here. I think there's also a metaphor there, obviously, of like sort of spring and youth and like the fresh ripe fruit of her innocence and this fear that Lyman is going to corrupt it, you know? Yeah. Um, like, yeah, she's very sexualized, like this hyper-sexualized child in a way. And the, the fruit metaphor kind of captures that. Yeah, I mean, because fruit, like even when you think about fruit, I always get really skeevy when we start comparing people with fruit because yeah. it's like fruit metaphors, particularly with women, it's they're so sexualized and they're it's such a metaphor of consumption so like we're gonna consume this person we're gonna consume this and it's 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 skeevy and so yeah i i think it's interesting to look at the balance of how Donnet writes it because she writes about like people who think that way like the men are right. so, women very sexualized but it doesn't mean yeah, that no, that's what i think she's doing is she's she's giving us this image of this girl as something to be consumed by the people who are thinking about her yeah, yeah. um and so we also get uh this relationship between philippa and jolita which is interesting and i think mainly because um there's a little bit of envy and jealousy and admiration also from Philippa. Like they're playing together. Philippa's plain. She hasn't developed breasts yet. She's got, you know, boring hair. And meanwhile, Jovita is this beautiful, perfect specimen of everything a young woman should be. And so Phyllis, Philippa's kind of like the, you know, the ugly duckling and Jolita is the swan. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts on that whole, like why does, why does Dunnett set it up that way? And what does this tell us about them? And what does it suggest you might happen with them? 
uh, there may be some jealousy um, between whatever happens in the future, especially if Lyman comes into the picture. Um, I mean, I think it's obvious Lyman will come into the picture with Jolita. So I would be very interested to see how Philippa reacts to it as well. I mean, Philippa, like her emotions around Lyman, I'm still not giving up my theory, by the way. <laughs> but like her emotions around Lyman are so strong. And like, there's one moment where she's super mad about all the rumors about him and women. Like he, she does this like, why everywhere he, like someone, Philippa said Philippa hoarsely, why everywhere he goes, he has hundreds and hundreds of, and then Kate says critics who are not old enough to learn tolerance. So like Kate's trying to back her down off a cliff, but like she's so mad that there's all these rumors about Lyman having a lot of lovers and, and so if Jolita becomes part of Lyman's life in that way, then like Flip is not gonna be happy. Yeah, and certainly not if he becomes part of Kate's life in that way either. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. That would be bad. Um, and I, I, can I just say I hope not? Like, I don't want Lyman and Kate to get together. What, why not? Because, first of all, I really can't imagine Lyman settling down in Flaws Valley and, like, hanging out there forever. And I love Kate there. Like, I love that she has this community and she's so competent. And, like, just that paragraph description of her and, like, the way that all the people in the Valley depend on her and the way that she's kept everything going. And, like, she's clearly the pivotal structure of this community of this valley and it's really awesome and i just don't see lyman and then so what is he gonna do drag her off somewhere or settle down there like i don't think so i think it's also important to remember that una is still very much a part of the story um yeah, apparently they, they keep talking about her so it makes me feel like she's definitely going to show up in this book again at some point did she and Ly but she and lyman didn't oh wait where are we in the story it would have happened by now, I think. Well, maybe it's just happened. Well, they talk about it. Like, they know that he's been hanging out with her in France. So I think the the uh, seduction had already happened at this point. But I don't know for sure. Because remember, there was that point in the book where it said, like, that was the only time they slept together. Yeah. So, and then she kind of vanishes. So all the rumors about her are coming from the, from all the interaction as, like, with, Liam Rowe and all of that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, everything the Scottish know at this point is rumors, right? They don't know exactly what happened, obviously. Um, but it is very telling that Kate's kind of fixating on this Irish woman who was beautiful. Um, so also, you know, quite important in this whole section is Jolita is ill. Um, and there's this whole segment where um, uh, Madame Donati won't allow Kate's doctor to see her because he's a man and Gabriel doesn't want her um, it's being seen by a male doctor. Um, and so they call an herb woman, um, who's a Roma, Romani person, Chadi Lockup, um, who shows up and uh, cures her with herbs somehow. Um, and also steals some things. In a I just think she steal the place. Yeah, she steals something in this kind of sketchy, like gypsy stereotype, sadly. Yeah. And the breaches that Kate was crying over, like. About, yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's actually very telling, right? That Kate is still mourning Gideon because she cries over his stolen stuff. I wasn't sure if she stole it or if that's what, you know, if the, the uh, Madame Donati didn't really have any money to pay for it. So, yeah, that's what I thought. Like, no, the implication was that she stole it. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, any thoughts on that whole section? It just seems a little bit pat to me that she suddenly gets ill and won't see a doctor. And then when this herb woman comes, she's suddenly healed again, almost immediately. Um, I don't know if there's anything going on there, but we know that Dunnett doesn't write anything in that doesn't lead anywhere. So it's, it's just interesting to me at this point. I really don't know what to expect from it. Yeah. It's so suspicious of everything. It's like, does that mean something? Does that mean something? <laughs> yeah. Because it does seem rather convenient, but... It's very sus, as they maybe, say. Maybe it's just the way it is. Um, so once Jolita is better, Kate realizes uh, the girl in her own right, and apart from the heavenly gift of her looks, was a person of character. Um, and then we have that comparison of her with Philippa, 
Philippa being abrupt, forthright as her mother, without just yet her mother's saving grace of humility and wit. Uh, Philippa sat at a loss and studied the other girl like a farm laborer at a flower show. <laughs> um, and then it also has a great description of Jolita. Jolita Reed Mallet, whose courage was of the order of her brothers and whose self-discipline on occasion went far beyond her years, willed herself better. Um, and she sings and plays and everybody loves her and she's all sunlight and magic. Um, so she seems lovely and then that's where we have that scene where they're brushing their hair which is just like a wonderful little image um, speaking of which there is fan art of it Jolita and Philippa Aww. by Bell Row on Deviant Art poor little Philippa poor Philippa Jolita made her cry. Um, all right. Uh, so we uh, then cut to uh, Tom, who has arrived to take Jolita away now that she's better. Um, and we get the whole backstory of why she is not going to mid culture, um, which kind of comes down to a fight between Richard and Sibylla where Richard thinks that they can't possibly have Jolita there because Lyman is too corrupted to be trusted near her. Um, I love that um, uh, Marietta is just like, it's like, grab the popcorn, Mildred. You know, <laughs> Marietta is just sitting there just like watching this. You can almost see like the tennis match where she's just like. The, the amazing description of her in appalled ecstasy. Right, yeah. The sewing and gaze at the mode. <laughs> right. With her hands over her mouth, she's just like, yeah. And this is this is in reaction to Sibylla saying, "Your real concern, I gather, is is in case we open a brothel." Yeah. And then Marianne is just like, "Whoa!" Yeah. You know. And, uh, and yeah, then, I love Sibylla's in this scene. I love how she just takes charge and like chastises her son in this moment. Yeah, well, this question about where she asked Richard, like, what have you seen in France that makes you so afraid for this child? And we know, well, what he saw in France was Taddy Boy. Was what? Know, all, the, all the rumors of Lyman is Taddy Boy and all the debauchery of the French court. So, like, that's what he saw in France. Yeah, I mean, there's this whole thing about, you know, um, you wouldn't expect morality and restraint at the French court. License is the mode, and Francis has been setting the fashion. Um, and this idea that Uno was only the most reputable of his indulgences. Um, he'll want something different now, something like falling romantically into young love. Um, and, and then Sevilla's like, that would be great. He can't follow me around forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, he is, you must admit, a little disruptive in the home. Um, and that's also where we have that great line where Sevilla, or Marietta says he's very young and Sevilla says, how old do you think he is? Yeah, she's very young at 16. And then Sibylla's like, how old do you think he is? I'm like, so like if, I had, if I had read that not knowing anything, I would have thought, oh, he's 19. You know, like. I mean, a, a woman, for a woman of 16 to marry a man in his, in his late teens or his 20s even is like perfectly fine. Totally fine, yeah. Or his 30s with that culture. I mean, yeah. There's no way he's in his 30s. That's no it. way. No way. I think he's under 25. Um, I was thinking of John Maxwell. I don't know how old John Maxwell was. And he married Agnes at 14. Right. Um, and, but I do think there's also like a little bit of Sibylla's in denial about what Francis has been up to. Mm -hmm. um, and this is kind of why Richard wins the argument is this implication that he's, he was in France and saw what Lyman got up to and she didn't. And she's kind of got this idea of like, my sweet, innocent little boy would never be doing anything so terrible. Um, and then, you know, Richard basically, um, kind of, I guess. I mean, it's worth, it's worth looking at this. Like, Sibylla says, unless he's changed very much, Francis surely will respect her. So, like, that's where she's going. And then Richard, it says, um, like, he's talking about his mother's self-deception when it comes to Francis. It says, at the time, unaccountably, he lost his head and said baldly, so he's not being diplomatic here. And he says, then I advise you to engage some fat presentable maids or better choose one or two grooms for their looks. 
Otherwise, I shall leave you the task of explaining to Sir Graham Reed Mallet the culture stewardship of his sister. In other words, if you don't have some really pretty boys in the stable to distract him, then he's going to seduce this girl. Yeah. Which like, is that's literally what he said. Which is a really interesting kind of connotation of like homosexuality equals like corruption, but also it's definitely like it means he'll screw anybody is kind of the implication because the, the threat is to a woman, even though the accusation is that he's been sleeping with men. Right. And like, like the even better comment is like, he'll be more distracted by the grooms than he would be by the cute maids. Yeah. Yeah. Like, or like, okay. And then Sibylla is like, that's quite enough. <laughs> you know, she just was like, all right. Well, it is the 1550s. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but anyway, we end up with Richard kind of conceding. Of course, he won't touch her, but she might be attracted to him. Um, and Richard kind of sadly says, you know, what do you think it costs me to admit that marriage between Francis and any young convent bred girl is in all honor, long past allowing? So this idea that Lyman is so corrupted by what he's done in Queen's Play that he can't marry a young, innocent woman now, that that's unacceptable because he's so corrupt which really yeah i don't think so i don't think so i think richard's being a little sanctimonious here like come on oh yeah you know um but i think sibylla is being a little bit naive she does say there is no vice there none i will not believe it and we just came from seeing caddy boy gone up to you and there's some yeah. vice there there's some vice there but that doesn't mean like he's corrupt. Uh, like it doesn't mean like he's a corrupting influence. Like they let him be alone with the queen, the young queen. You know, like he's not clearly he's not gonna harm children. No, but he may seduce young women or young men. Like young men. Um, so they decide that it's going to be a better influence for Delita to go stay with Jenny Fleming rather than with the cool. Why? Why? <laughs> I just wrote, well, that's a bad idea. <laughs> no. The whole idea being that Jenny is going to be way too busy to bother with her and that it'll really be the Erskine's taking care of her. Okay. But Margaret isn't there yet. So, like, we're going to send her to Jenny because we know Margaret's going to show up at some point. But right now she's not there. So <laughs> it just seems like a terrible idea. Also, because Jenny does not seem like the kind of person who would really suffer a incredibly gorgeous young woman in her like that seems like a bad idea right there because competition competition like yikes this stunningly beautiful young 16 year old girl is gonna go stay with jenny fleming really yeah i think we can tell that this is maybe not gonna turn out the way richard hopes and and of course we also get that implication from the final sentence which is uh, that it was the first argument with his mother he had ever won, and had he known it, the most useless. Yeah. I don't think uh, he's really aware of Jenny Fleming's reputation at this point, though. Like, he knows, yes, that she's having the bastard son of the King of France, but, like, he didn't deal with her um, as way Lyman did, so... They've all got to know. No, I bet Jenny Fleming... She's been around these... They've been in the same circles forever. Like, it's all... Like, she grew up like, Margaret grew up with her mother acting this way her whole life. So Jenny Fleming's been a disaster for decades, I'm sure. Like, I agree. There's <laughs> there's no way Richard doesn't know. There's no he way he doesn't know. But I guess he thinks it's not so bad as Lyman. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of sad coming from Richard. No, it totally is sad. Because, like, they had such a wonderful scene together in Queen's Play, and they were so reconciled. So for now, Richard to come out and be like, you know, you don't know what it costs me to admit that he's too corrupted to ever like get married to an innocent young woman is like, what the hell, Richard? Your brother's not that young. You were the one telling him he's got his whole life ahead of him. Um, and now you're like judging him and telling other people, telling his mother, you know, that he's corrupted. It's kind of bad, Richard. Sketchy. Not, not good. Bad show, man. Bad show. Yeah, Richard, don't go back to Game of Kings, Richard. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think Richard does have a tendency to get a little sanctimonious, though, like a lot of the time. Like, he's kind of holier than thou. I would say maybe part of it is how much he's kind of shaped his identity 
as like the good one in contrast to his like bad brother and the father like fed that by you know ripping on everything Lyman did and calling him you know wastrel and decadent whatever yeah how dare he spend his time reading books and making music Mm. um and Richard probably has picked up on some of that subconsciously and you know he loves Lyman but there's that bit of his father in him too oh yeah um, so Tom picks up Jolita to take her to Bog Hall with Jenny, and he talks to Kate, um, and they talk about how Philippa still hates Lyman, um, but that Jolita probably would not. And Tom, of course, famous last words, says Jolita and Francis are unlikely to meet. <laughs> um, yeah, I did th- nope. <laughs> That's, I also do love this bit, this little exchange with Tom and Kate, just about, like, Hey, can you get sick? Because my doctor is kind of mad that I got this herb woman in. And, and Tom's like, don't have time. The next time I promise, I'll fall off my horse right in front of your door. And she's like, oh, no, no, he's not good at bones. Don't do that. But it's just cute. Oh, it's super adorable. I mean, and just every, done it, every line has this incredible wit to it, you know? She was a genius. She was so, such a cool person. Um, so we end with Jolita and Philippa. Jolita, uh, Philippa laughing and Jolita singing snatches of rather rude lyrics. Um, so again, this idea that Jolita isn't quite so pure and perfect. She's got this mischievous, playful side that just makes her extra adorable. Yeah, and then it, 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 it ends, that sentence ends with, and did not see the shiver that overtook Kate, which, woo, that's ominous. What, what do you think caused that shiver? I don't know. Something to do with Jolita. She think uh, Lyman and Jolita are match made in heaven? No. I mean, it's possible. Is it though? Is it possible? I don't think. Do you think, uh, I know you don't like Lyman with Kate, and I know you don't like Lyman with Una. How do you feel about Lyman with Jolita? Maybe. I mean, her, I'm suspicious because there's all this like, they can't get together, they can't get together. And then, so then the implication is like, oh no, they're gonna get together. But then I'm suspicious of that. But um, her whole mischievous, like she's super in- insightful and mischievous. So that's a nice match for Lyman. Mm-hmm. If she's not horrible. I'm still holding out for Dee's theory actually, so. Philippa? I still yeah. want Philippa to be, yeah. Cause I like, I think mean, she's so mad. <laughs> and obviously she's too young. She's what, 13 here? Yeah. What's so, obviously we still got to go through a couple more years, but I just feel like the depth of her emotion, like she's too young to have a romantic attachment to Lyman, but I feel like like the depth of her anger is motivated in something more than just he pulled me, you know, like she's got complicated issues when it comes to Lyman. I mean, that's a very specific trope, isn't it? Sort of the uh, I don't like you at all. Oh yeah. I actually love you. I don't know what it's called. I'm not as enemies, to love en- enemies, enemies to lovers. Yeah. Okay. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> oh, you are going to have to read Catholic Prince after this. Yeah. That's definitely why. That's one of the reasons why I like the idea of Philippa and Lyman is because I do love the enemies to lovers trope so much. And you like the May December relationship. And I love May December relationships. That's right. I really love May December relationships. As long as they're not like creepy. Like, so she's got to be at least. I do, if they get together, which again, I'm hanging on to my theory, but <laughs> I might be completely, you know, who knows. She might die of smallpox in the next book. Ew, don't but, say um, I mean, now that she's back, you know, I didn't know if we'd ever get back to the Somerville, so. Yeah, but she's got to be at least like, I don't know. I would prefer like 17 or 18, <laughs> at least. I mean, I can understand 16 based on the culture of the day, but. Like, we got to let some years go by before, <laughs> before it comes back. Um, so in terms of all this, this, part, this is the entirety of part one, and it's all kind of set up for building up your anticipation for what's going to happen. So what did it make you anticipate or want to happen or expect to happen? Um, I'm anticipating Lyman's interaction with both of the mallets. Um, obviously, we're going to have the moment where he does meet Jolita, see what happens there. But um, they're also setting up him sort of going to Malta and spending some time with the Knights Hospitaller. And not just Graham Reed Mallet, but 
sort of the other characters that they talked about, Leon Strozzi and uh, the Chevalier de Villegagnon. So, I don't know. I'm sure there's going to be a lot more interesting people on Malta as well that we will have to learn many names. I'm yeah. glad we didn't have to do it yet. <laughs> yeah, that was useful. I think, obviously, we're going to go to Malta. So, um, you know, is... is is Jolita gonna like run away and try to get back to her brother and Lyman's gonna be tasked with like, I don't know, rescuing her or something? Like, cause I feel like we're not gonna leave her as a character in Scotland if Lyman goes to Malta. So how are we gonna get Jolita and Lyman to Malta in a way that makes sense? I don't know. No. I mean, there's a there's a possibility we may split time between Malta and Scotland. I think there's enough that's been set up with what's happening in Scotland too. Um, that we we spent all that time with Will Scott in the beginning, and there's this sort of feud between the Kurs and the Scots that we didn't really know about. That's true. We gotta we gotta follow that. Somewhere. I mean, it could just be a side story with the the brunt of the action taking place with Lyman, but yeah, that would be interesting to sort of jump back and forth. If Jolita is a main character in the novel, which it seems like she will be, because why would you introduce a brand new character at the beginning and spend so much time on her if she's not going to be pivotal? So if she's a main character in the novel, it would be weird to have her in one place and Lyman in another place, like the whole novel. Like, it seems like if she's going to be a main character, then I want her interacting with Lyman. I don't want I don't want like her and Will Scott and Buclu and the Kurs in Scotland and then Lyman in Malta with her brother and I don't know. But maybe that's the way we'll do it. And as you said, Una is, we've been reminded of her a few times. So how yeah. is it going to fit into all of this? So last we saw Una, she had just disappeared, right? Yeah. Told she told her had, not to follow. Yeah. She said not to So she's just, maybe she went to Malta. <laughs> I mean... Oh. Why not? Oh, yeah. <laughs> As one does. Why not? We still have our suspicion that she might be pregnant. So that was, I, I think that's, I still think that's an interesting idea. So. Yeah. And Cormac O'Connor's still around somewhere too. Not like I want him to be. I don't like him. They did just leave him sort of there. What's her name's dead, but. He's still around. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Aunt, that horrible old vulture. But we know for sure that Una is no longer in his like employ slash. He would have killed her. She would. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she's no longer. Okay. So that's good. Yeah. Who knows? So you know it's going to be a big reunion in Malta. So knowing that Lyman doesn't want to ally with anyone whose ideals don't match his own and that his plan is to fight for Scotland, what, why would he go to Malta? I don't know yet. That is what we need to find out. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, that's why I'm wondering, are they going to like task him with some sort of mission to go to Malta? So we've got this paper alliance between the Turks and the French. The French and the Scottish have aligned, allied. The English and the Scottish are sort of allied-ish right now. And the English and the French, yeah. And the English and the French are sort of allied. So maybe they're sending him to Malta to do something with the Turks and or the Holy Roman Empire? And See, like, who knows? I don't think he'd go if on the Queen's orders, though. If if the Dowager Queen wanted him to go there to check something out, I think he'd be like, no, yeah. I'm working with you. So it's got to be his own reason for going there. There's got to be some sort of personal reason that he goes. Yeah. Does Richard ask him to go for something or Sibylla ask him to go for something? I guess we'll find out. I wonder if that French lady, the Dame de du de Chance, is going to come back into it somehow. I still think she knew a lot of information for somebody who just showed up so quickly and left again. We're, we're definitely not done with her. She'll be back. Oh, she'll be back. Um, who else do we think is going to come back from 
Queen's play. I think uh, he's coming back. Una's coming back. I don't know about Oliemro, but I would love him to show up at oh, some I point. Would too. Ooh, Ooh, um, Abernathy and um, what's his name? The other guy. Tosh. Tosh. Yeah, I bet they come back. Um, just because we have this whole Middle East Turks element to the story, I bet they come back. Um. I bet the French court people don't come back. No. So we don't see them again. I don't think we'll have any time with Mary Queen of Scots either. Oh no, I like her. I think they're gonna leave her in France for a while and I don't think Lyman is going back to France, at least not in this book, so. I wonder how you get to Malta from Scotland. Do you take a boat the whole way? You would take a boat. You would take a boat. So he's not gonna go over land in France. Yeah, you take a boat. Yeah, you have, you have to, because Malta's an island. You have to take a boat to get there. Right, but I mean, would you go overland through France and Spain and then take a boat? Or would you just get on a boat in Scotland and go around? It would take longer, I think, by boat the whole way, but. Would it though? I think boat's faster than, overland is super slow back then. I don't know. I don't have no idea, guys. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, we're talking horse and carts, like. Yeah. Horses, horses. Get on a bus. I bet the boat's faster. Uh, I think the boat's faster. in the airport. Come on. <laughs> Any final questions, comments, predictions, etc., about this uh, part one and the rest of the book? No, but I am enjoying it so far. So. Yeah, uh, I get. I'm happy we get to talk about the characters that everybody always talks about all the time. You know, we got Kate back. You guys now know Jolita, and uh, we'll get to know Gabriel. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. All right, well, I have not been Googling, nor have I gone to the Dorothy Dunnett Society or anything because I'm afraid of learning things. Right. But I really want to get to the point where I can talk to people about this. <laughs> you have four more books to read, and then you'll be able to talk to everybody. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, and when the world reopens, we can all go to a Dunnett event in Edinburgh. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you for following. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.